Welcome to my uh, overview of uh, model railway locomotives in my collection. In this video, uh, we are going to be looking at the BR Standard Pacifics and pati particularly the Britannia locomotives that um, I've got in my collection here. So, starting off with the uh, Triang version, um, this was quite a uh, popular model back in the 1960s and with good reason. We can see that it actually captures the essence of these locomotives and um, whilst we, it's quite easy now to find fault with the, uh, this model by today's standards, I think back in the day um, it was something which was uh, quite spectacular. Uh, I, I remember that the, the actual date when I got this, which was on the 6th of the 6th, 1966, and I went down to buy this with my father um, in, it was in, I bought it from Hatton's, uh, which was then just a little shop on Swithstown Road. Anyway, just ha let's have a look at this locomotive. It's still in quite reasonable condition um, and it's, it has served me well. I think the model came out in about 1961 and the tooling um, stayed pretty much the same for you know, a couple of decades. Um, I think the first versions of this came out with the earliest wheels, uh, what were they, Sintered Iron or uh, Marzek, I'm not sure which, um, but um, they were soon replaced by uh, these wheels which became quite common within the Triang range, um, um, yeah, much much better in terms of uh, um, you know having the gaps between the spokes. Um, so let's have a look at some of the detail on the top. Just looking around the back here because you can just about make out that there is um, a ladder on the back, back of the tender and that was a really nice touch which gave it a, um, you know, uh, gave it a point of interest. So there it is, it still, still runs well. It won't go over the track here, or rather it won't go over the points and uh, crossovers. Um, it's, it's, you know, and I have got code 100 track, but the, the flanges are just too deep. Um, but I get it out every now and again, just to give it a, a short spin back and forth. Now moving on, um, this is a model that dates from the 1990s and it's one which I've detailed, renamed and renumbered. As you can see it's a Territorial Army 70048 and this is a splendid looking uh, locomotive. What I've actually done on this is actually pick out the detail. Um, first off um, I've painted the axle boxes uh, yellow uh, because they were roller bearings um, and different combinations of roller bearings were tried on these lo locomotives uh, Timkins, Skafco, um, some just had them on the driving wheels some didn't have them on the uh, trailing truck underneath the cab I think all the tenders had them though and um, it, is, it can be a bit uh, pernickety trying to work out which ones had what uh, you have to go into sort of uh, mega detail um, in the archives to find, you know, uh, find out which type of bearings and on which wheels that they had. Again, it was all in the idea of testing out to see which which worked best. Anyway, getting back to the model, um, I do my usual thing, which is to detail the front. Um, the smoke box door number. Um, that you see is, is backed in red. That's an etched nameplate that's on there. The tooling was a Margate one, but this was at the time before, just before they uh, did a complete retooling um, of this model. And they probably took the step to do something about the um, 
the the one that they brought out in the 1980s, which I think was was it William Shakespeare. It was looking a bit uh, uh, outclassed, you know, with the likes of Bachman and other uh, makes coming onto the market. So that tooling seems to have been tweaked. I'm not sure that it was a completely uh, new tool, but first thing to note, if you look at the, the uh, coupling, rod, coupling rods on the driving wheels, um, they're not rectangular in shape. You can actually see that there is a shape to them. Uh, which captures uh, the realism um, that you could um, you could actually see the uh, that shape on the, on the actual locomotives. The cylinders are better proportioned. The bogey wheel is better proportioned, better size. Um, the 1980s uh, version, William Shakespeare, still had that front bogey on it and that sized cylinder. As you, as you can see on this, this is a much better proportion. On the top also, uh, there's a better rendition of the dome and the chimney, uh, much more in proportion. What I've done on this is to pick out the injector pipe work, uh, which is a prominent feature on these locomotives, um, a visually very prominent feature. Um, and you can see that I've painted the beneath the uh, firebox the cab pipework above it the pipework was lagged and I've tried to represent that there but also pick out the the brass connections on there when it does just give the model a lift in my opinion the thing that was missing on this locomotive though was the very um, distinctive um, injector pipe that goes up from the injector, I think it's the exhaust steam ejector on this side, and then runs along the top of here, and the water goes into the boiler there. And that is called a clack valve. Now, that's the pipe, which was just a bit of plastic. Now, that wasn't represented on the model, so um, quite obviously that's something I've added on but it really adds to the overall look of the locomotive. Um, still got the gap underneath there, a bit of daylight. Um, I, can, I can just about live with that, but unfortunately the tender is very set back from the, um, from the draw bar on the, on the locomotive. Um, I wish they could have got that a bit closer. But anyway, there it is. Um, similarly, um, I've done the same on this locomotive, which I've renamed William Shakespeare and renumbered. Um, has a smaller BR1A tender. Uh, Inject pipe work. There you can see the pipe that goes up and along and into the boiler. And detail picked out. And uh, befitting this locomotive, it's all decked out in Golden Arrow regalia. Uh, this was one of two Britannias um, that were stationed at Stewart's Lane Depot, just outside Victoria Station. Um, and they were kept in pristine condition. The other one being 70014 Iron Duke. I saw Iron Duke at Edgell's um, locomotive depot in 1967. Very sad it looked too. Um, Iron Duke had a was paired off with a larger tender, a 1D tender. And I looked up on the smoke deflectors. There was no nameplate, but it been um, be, the name had been painted on. And beneath it, I could see the bolt holes uh, where the arrow for the golden arrow was was located. And I thought, what a sad come down now, uh, seeing that locomotive in Edge Hill shed. It did come down from Carlisle on a on a Liverpool on a Glasgow to Liverpool exchange train. 
I think it all looks very smart with the uh, regalia on the front, all that uh, golden arrow stuff. Very decorative, but a very good looking locomotive. Again, you've got the fine detail and the fine shape of the uh, coupling rod. Moving along, we've got Dornoch Firth, the last of the class to be built. Uh, this came in a set um, with three co Mark I coaches, all weathered. I think it was called the Thames Clyde um, Express. And this is the most fantastic bit of weathering, I've factory weathering, that, I've, that I have ever seen on a model OO gauge locomotive. Um, I haven't done this, I haven't touched it at all. Um, the only thing I've done is add that uh, pipe again. Where is it? There. Because that was missing, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's quite a visually important thing uh, on the on the Britannias. Now, the reason I wax lyrical about the weathering on this, this is a, this is exactly how it was. You can see the. Um, the grimy dirtiness of the chassis and the wheels and as you go further up the locomotive above the running place and onto the boiler the green starts to emerge again and that's exactly how it uh, how it would appear and I, I remember seeing locomotives like this particularly uh, the Britannias which were green um, because you could barely see any green on them um, but if you could, it was about mid-drifts along the boiler and along the tender that you could see it. But the subtlety of the weathering doesn't end there, because if we go and look at the top of the locomotive, I'll move back a bit, because there's a bit of a shine coming in from the light, you can see that the green starts to go black. And again, that's exactly how it would have been as the, uh, the dirt and the smoke um, would leave its residue on the top of the boiler. So that's a fantastic bit of weathering. Uh, if I move the camera back a bit, I think you can probably just gauge that a bit more. See, so black at the top, then f the black merging into green, the green becoming a bit more prominent, prominent. And then as you go down, it's all dusty. Um, and murky again. I think that's a superb bit of uh, weathering on that locomotive. Right, moving along here again, this is Lightning. No it isn't, it's Black Prince. One of them was Lightning that I had, uh, maybe one of the others that I renamed. Now this one is completely retooled. This is um, from the ground up. Um, there's, there's nothing remaining from um, the Margate uh, version of the Britannia. This is entirely brand new. And this is a fantastic looking uh, locomotive. I mean the Britannias were such elegant, good looking engines anyway. And what we can see here is that all of this detail, all of this detail is separately fitted. It is not moulded on. And yes, we've got the ladder on the back, uh, but the footsteps as well. There we go. There. Detail on that with a mesh on it. Now, did I do anything on this? I didn't paint, didn't have to paint the axle boxes. I did paint the copper on the um, injector pipe work. And I think, yes, the, the lagging that goes um, around the top of the firebox and just underneath the cab that was already there. Everything on this locomotive is uh, finely detailed and finely proportioned.
So moving along, we come to the, the Britannia's younger brother, the clan. Again, this is a beautifully model locomotive. Some say this is the most beautifully proportioned of all the BR standards. They may have something in that. And you can see straight away that the boiler is smaller. Mind you, that was their Achilles heel. The, the clans, it turned out, were neither fish nor fowl. They didn't have the gusto or the performance of the Britannias, and, and there wasn't anything that they could do that a Black Five or a Jubilee couldn't do. So, you know, it seems that uh, the management realised the mistake, because only, only ten were built, and um, the, six that, the six of them that were based at uh, Glasgow Polmody um, ended their days quite quickly. They were all take, they, their allocation was taken out of service in 1962, which uh, for the BR standards was, was an early withdrawal. Six were retained at Carlisle Kingmore, and they lasted till about the middle of 1966. Um, but they were something of a disappointment. But um, yeah, there was the shortcomings were noted early on, and they were supposed to have had their turn on the rugby testing plant, but for some reason. Uh, they, it didn't happen and then as the years moved on the, it became there was no point to it uh, because the writing was on the wall for steam so they were just left to linger on um, without any modifications at all um, they, they weren't regarded as poor steamers and the, I think the, there is the project that's underway now to rebuild to, to build from scratch the, the 11th one. Um, they're going to do some investi investigative work on the boiler and the drafting in particular uh, to see if they can get it to, um, uh, you know, steam and perform to its potential. That would be an interesting thing to see on the, uh, if it, you know, if it comes to fruition, which I sincerely hope it does. And talking of one-offs and uh, failures. Here we have the Britannia's bigger brother. So this is Duke of Gloucester, a magnificent looking locomotive. And boy oh boy did that set the preservation scene alight in the 1990s uh, with its performances on the road. Um, prior, to the I A prior to the A1 Papacorn Pacific um, project this was the most ambitious um, undertaking ever uh, by a preservation society because whilst the the hulk was still basically intact uh, the cylinders and a lot of detail and stuff uh, was was missing and they had to build I think do they do all of the cylinders certainly did two if not all three there's a funny little statistic for you 999 um, BR standard locomotives were built um, that, that's from Britannia herself to Evening Star, 999 um, standards and only one of them had more than two cylinders and it, it was Duke of Gloucester. Looking back at the model, um, Hornby reigned back a little bit on the, the detailing of this. Not, um, not that they didn't include the detail but um, they decided that they would compromise on the application of the detail rather than having, um, you know, uh, fastidiously, fiddly um, separate fittings, which all look very nice, but unfortunately um, very easy to um, break off, uh, no matter how well you handle them. Uh, they decided on compromising and having quite a few of them moulded on. So... If we look at the exhaust uh, steam injector pipework that's underneath the firebox here, all of that is moulded on, as indeed is the um, pipework on the top of the firebox. All of that is moulded on. Now I paint. It was 
compared to the uh, Britannia's where I um, picked out the detail, the moulding on this was much more prominent and it was easier to actually paint. I actually painted the, um, uh, the, the pipework here and the brass connections which makes them stand out and of course um, the pipework that's on the uh, on the injector there it's all copper pipework. I remember seeing this locomotive at close quarters and just I would say that you know my eyes were on stalks looking at this it was just so impressive. I can use a phrase, certainly more in, more in your face than, than, than the Britannia was. This had a bigger look to it, although the boiler's the same size, but the firebox, which I think is 48 square feet, um, compared to 42 square feet on the, um, on the Britannia's. So I suppose it's a bit like the relationship between the rebuilt, um, uh, Battle of Britons and West Countries compared to the rebuilt merchant navies. They look the same but somehow the West Countries and the Battle of Britons look a bit smaller somehow but you can't put your finger on it. Um, but if you look um, at the firebox end you can see how much more massively proportioned the merchant navy is and so it is with Duke of Gloucester. There's a much more massively proportioned uh, firebox and the distance between the trailing wheel and the rear driver is much bigger than it is on, visually looks bigger, um, it's noticeably bigger uh, than it is on the Britannia. Of course the unique feature on these engines was the uh, drive uh, cap caprotti valve gear as opposed to the normal reciprocating wall shirts. Um, this was a feature. Again uh, an enormous amount of research and work went into uh, rectifying the faults on this locomotive because again being a one-off um, it, it had so much potential it was put in the rosters with the Coronation class specifics and it didn't fare well at all. The drivers weren't used to um, the pe peculiarities or some of the more unique uh, requirements for um, driving a Caprotti uh, locomotive compared to the uh, Walshirt's valve gear, which was basically universal right across the country on um, most big 